Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is next week at the same time on Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. on the 20th, Beginning Research in Ireland with James Tanner. <clears throat> if you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Dr. Roger Meinert, who will be giving a presentation on census records in Germany from 1816 to 1916. Roger P. Meinert received his doctoral degree from the Ohio State University in German language history and second language acquisition theory. He taught German language and history for 10 years and then became a professional family history teacher, researcher, sorry. Accredited by the Family History Library for Research in Germany and Austria, he worked for 12 years as a private genealogical researcher. From 2003 to 2019, he served as a professor of family history at Brigham Young University. The author of 167 publications, he directs the research program, German Immigrants in American Church Records. The series now consists of 28 volumes, of 28 volumes, in 2019, Meinert was recognized for his years of service to the Palantines to America Society and also received the Shirley Reimer Lifetime Achievement Award from the International German Genealogical Partnership. And we're glad to have Roger with us today. And Dr. Meinert, if you're ready, we'll turn the time over to you. And the recht schönen guten Abend. So pleased to have you join us for this great topic, a new topic, I think, in a lot of ways. I haven't spoken to any group since last September. I feel very much isolated, as, of course, most of you have the same feelings. So, But what we have tonight may be totally new to many of you. In fact, we have experts in the field of German family history who do not know this topic. So this represents a tremendous adventure in my life and a great opportunity that was mine to contribute to the literature that supports German family history research. So are you ready for something new? We don't get this chance very often. You know, we work on church records, we work on civil records until we're blue in the face and in rare conditions, land records, military records, but not very often. So I hope this is new to you. If it's not new, you haven't heard this enough times to know everything about the topic, so we hope to expand your knowledge. Why in the world did this fascinate me so much? Because of the questions coming up that I couldn't answer. Now, you know, of course, that from the United States perspective, the first thing we go to in most cases when people ask us, hey, uh, what do I do with this family history stuff? How do I build it? family tree, most of us will go right to the federal census. Why? Great place to start. We do it every 10 years on the, on the zero. Every year in 1890 is nicely preserved and available. Standard form used everywhere. All the states, all the territories use the same form for a given year. And you can gain access to every one of those in two or three different places that we could name. You know, of course, Family Search, Ancestry, Heritage Quest, places like that. This is not my invention. I saw this actually way back in 1993 on a car in Salt Lake. Old genealogists never die, they just lose their senses. Now, if we were together, we'd all be laughing, at least you'd all be laughing, and I would act as if this isn't funny. Well, what about census records in Germany? If these are the mainstay or the great starting point in America, what about Germany? If you ask the experts, before I undertook this project, I would 
have gotten these responses. But if you ask experts now who still don't know about my study of the census records, you'll get these responses. Well, we know that there is an 1819 census in mecklenburg schwerin Great detail, it's all on microfilm. Schleswig-Holstein did them according to the Danish pattern, 1835 to 60 on the fives. We know that Prussia did a census only because their gazetteer published based on the 1905 census. But I looked at that gazetteer so many times and didn't ask myself, what census? Odd that we don't ask questions like that. There was one in 1852 in Hanover, the old province. I learned about this when I was giving lectures in Germany back in, oh, 2001, I think. So otherwise, you wouldn't know about that. And that's all we know. And the bottom line you get is generally this. There are probably some other ones, but we don't know for sure. I Capice. This man has done genealogy for 50 years. When I showed him the project, he's the best friend of my publisher in Germany. And the three of us met, and I told him about this. And I, he says, I've written more than 100 books on genealogical topics, but I've never seen a German census record in 50 years. In fact, he turned to the publisher and said, Eckhart, I don't care if you like this book. You're publishing this book by Professor Miner. Okay, these answers are going to be required if we're going to find out for sure what the situation is with German census records. In which of the states were they conducted? Remember, we didn't have a Germany until 1871. By that time, the United States is closing in on, on a century of existence. When were they done? For what purposes? You remember the US Census was done for two purposes to assign seats in the House of Representatives and for direct taxation, which we don't do anymore. What content did they have? That's one of the main questions family historians will ask. More, do they exist anymore, the originals? Where are they if they exist? Have they been digitized, microfilmed, copied in any, by any media? How can we gain access to them? Eight important questions. Now, before I launch into this as a good academician, I'm going to see if anybody's done it before. How embarrassed would I be if I found there was already a book on the German census records and I was spending time, effort, and money to do that? So, where do we find this literature? I found one major article about types of census records written in English, interestingly enough. One book about years and regulations. No publications about content, but many publications about statistics. In many cases, people say, well, we can tell you exactly what our numbers are in this state, but we have nothing more. So in that one article, the first one there, the major article, he said the history of German census records has not yet been written. And that was brilliantly stated. He wrote that article in, in English. Now my frenzied mind sees the project in detail. The grand goal, of course, a book on German census records. So how do I design this? I've got to determine what is Germany. I've got to do this for not just the 1871 to present Germany. I've got to go back to some convenient time before that, because as we know, the first major immigration in, into the United States, I should say into North America from Germany was in the, 18, or the early 18th century, 1709, 1712, but it really picked up after 1820. So I want the 19th century. My, kind, you know, my time constraints are going to include most of that. Then I have to do communications with archives. And you know, this just cannot be done from my office at Brigham Young University. I've got to be on site. Too many archivists are bound to say, well, come on in, we'll show you what you want, but we can't look for it for you. And this is gonna cost some money. It's gonna cost a lot of money. So here is my geographical extent. These are the borders of the German Empire, 1871 to 1918. The greatest extent 
Germany ever was, if you want to talk about any Germany, not including the Austrian Empire and Switzerland. So there were from time to time 38 to 41 independent states. Now I took 1816 because Napoleon is gone. And the Congress of Vienna in 1815-16 will draw lots of new lines for states on the map. By the time we get to 1871, we have 38 German states locked in till 1918 when Germany again begins to break down. So I'll take 1816 to 1918 essentially to 1916 because 1916 was the last census done in the German Empire as I found out later. Congress of Vienna up to 19, from 1816 to 1916, very nicely an exact century. Now the problem began right off the bat because what we call census has not always been used as a term applied to German records by archivists, by catalogers, by microfilmers. There are these, what do we have there? 10 different words, all of which might be attached in catalogs such as the Family History Library in Salt Lake City with census records. So my initial contacts, I wrote to all state and regional archives in modern Germany. And I had to worry about border changes. Hessen today is really not at all like Hessen in the old days. Now, some of the archivists said, we didn't ever have censuses done in our state. Most of them said, well, yes, we they were conducted in our territory, but we only have numbers. We have no papers. So back to the guy who wrote that big article. In general, the original census records are kept in local archives, and the central archives, and there's often more than one in each federal state, are not always informed of their existence. More research needs to be done in this field. This was a brilliant statement. Now, Ralph Gehrmann, sitting up there in Lübeck or in Rostock, didn't go to the archives, but his analysis of the situation as he understood it was really spot on. So how do I design this? I've got to get the approval from my chair, from the dean, and oh yes, living in Germany and Austria. My wife said, I want to be in Austria again. We'd already lived in, she had already lived in Vienna three times and I'd been there twice with her for a long time. So she said, can't we live in Vienna? I said, Jeannie, this is a German census. I'm not going to do the Austrian census. She said, but it's only three hours in a car from Vienna to the German border. And if you want me to be happy for six months, I said, no problem. So BYU had an apartment sub lit in Vienna. We took that and my wife was in it all the way. And she also said, by the way, this is terribly important. As you know, it helps to have a supportive spouse or partner to help you in this. I said, Jeannie, we're going to spend several thousand bucks out of our own pocket. She said, not a problem if I can live in Vienna. So decision, the chair said, yes, yes, yes. Apartment available. Got some university funding from two sources. Wow, was that important? Jeannie said, yes. Now, we can't go to Germany right off the bat. We've got to do our homework the very best way we can. So I have an assistant who knows the Family History Library catalog inside and out, an absolute master, or mistress of this. She combed that catalog using the 10 German words and English words that I showed you a few screens ago. Oh, by the way, yes, there is a handout to this to this presentation, and we'll have to make that available to you by some medium. My BYU host can probably tell me how I can get that into your hands, so you don't have to write down everything you see. She found, with all these different search words, about 100 microfilms that have real census records, and the majority of those have the records not under the term census. I'm not criticizing the Family History Library catalogers. They're they're greatly overworked. So actual census documents, we copied examples of each one to start our archive. Then I sent hundreds of emails 
to counties and major city archives to ask about census records in their collections. Now, you know that, you probably know that Brigham Young University is a legitimate publish or perish research university. So it can't surprise you that I spent nearly 500 hours with my assistant in the search of the library catalog in Salt Lake and the hundreds and hundreds of emails to Germany. This all had to be done before I went. Off to Europe. So we're living in Vienna. Vienna is in the bottom right corner there in the gray. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, I've been writing emails to all these archives. Do you have these? Oh, yes, you do. May I come? May I come on this date? Setting up the trips, getting the rental cars, and the dotted lines are flights from Vienna up to Hanover and up to Berlin on different occasions. Planned and carried out research trip number one, number two, and number three, a total of seven weeks on the road. And thank heavens my wife knows German. Because of that, she was able to, to read things and speak to people in the archives. And then between trips and after trips, organizing, analyzing all the documents, translating them, and of course, writing the chapters of the books. This was a fun situation. Now, I love these archivists. They're so helpful. They know their stuff, but not totally. So two or three times my wife and I heard this. I've heard that there were census records made now and then, but I've never seen one, and you won't find one in this archive. Well, I remember in one archive, I better not mention that, where I found them under something like housing lists, and I brought the archive director down, and we saw them. He bristled, almost like rats. I wish you hadn't found this so I wouldn't be wrong about my statement. So, but the others were saying, wow, this is wonderful. Why don't we have it cataloged properly? Let's change the designation. Because on the paper, the first page, it says census, Volkszählung. It doesn't say list of residents. Okay, there's my dear wife. We just celebrated 46 years together. And we're in one of Germany's most romantic settings, Hangman's Bridge in Nuremberg. These are the stats. 3,000 images scanned and enough information to write the, 40, the 34 of 38 states. And then I found a Polish student at the University of Vienna who helped me conduct research uh, in Poland in former German territories. We got all the 38 states done. Can we answer my eight questions? Of course, as a true academician, I've got to have answers. Yes. Now, the reason I described for you the process is because I'm hoping you can gain confidence in my results. If I just said, well, I wandered over to Germany, traveled around, wrote a book, you might wonder, is there reliability? Can we generalize? Well, I'm not generalizing. I'm writing about 38 different states. You're saying, wow, in the United States, you don't have to do that. Number one, in which states were they, were they conducted? Every one of 38 states sometime between 1816 and 1916. When were they done? Many of these, every three years from 1834 to 64, you're thinking, wow, the US census is every 10 years. But you may also be thinking that Wisconsin, Illinois, and other states did one on the fives. So we actually have two census enumerations every 10 years. Prussian provinces, 16 times in that time period. And that wasn't the most frequent, by the way. Some states as few as three before 1867. So it's a mixed bag, but my book had to show you the situation in each of 38 states in particular. Now, from 1871 to 1916, the German Empire exists and they will do this every five years. 71 was the first year of existence. They did it then, then they went 75, 80, all the way to 1915, that's World War I, they couldn't do it. So they put it off to 1916, then the empire collapsed in 1918. For what purposes? Now, this is really important because this is not at all the situation we have in the United States. And yes, I cheated. My assistant could only find a census taker in 
the US. Yes, that is a portrait of George Washington. But picture this in Frankfurt or München or Dresden or Hanover. This could very well be what it looked like. For the distribution of customs, wow. Many Americans, by the way, over the years have been scared of filling out the census because they thought their taxes might be raised. It's the opposite in Germany. The census was done primarily to distribute customs revenues, to send money to the individual states. Now, notice number three, no evidence. I found no evidence of taxation and little evidence of military data. Once in a blue moon, the census might say, are you on active military service? Are you on reserve military status? But that's pretty rare. Well, this is fun too, because they started asking about farm size, number of structures, outbuildings, how many trees, cherry, apple, peach, etc. Now, cherry and peach don't work well in Germany. But they started counting things like that. I have not seen a US census that does that. So customs unions, we had a bunch of those, but picture this, Bavaria Württemberg, you know that they join each other. They face each other across a couple hundred miles of the north-south border in South Germany. If in fact they have a customs union, they don't have to collect customs on the border between Bavaria and Württemberg. They can get rid of all the stations, all the maintenance, all the employees. But the idea is that any money paid in duties to any of the Bavarian borders or Württemberg borders would come into a central office and then they conduct the census. If Bavaria has, let's say 55% of the people, they get 55% of the revenues collected. Württemberg gets 45%. That's how all these unions work. Now, the one at the bottom is most important because Prussia, as you might remember, was about 60, 62% of the entire German language territory in the borders of Germany. And a lot of the customs unions that formed away from or without Prussia were scared that Prussia's economic success and influence, read power, could easily become political. And the fact of the matter is, yes, it happened precisely that way. So we had a customs union with these Bavaria Württemberg, they were not Prussian. We had them with Hanover, Braunschweig, a bunch of the North Germans wouldn't get involved. And the port cities, Hamburg, Bremen, Lübeck would not be involved because they already had their customs unions with their port authorities. How's the customs union work? I explained that already. So, and of course, if you can picture this, I've got a whole bunch of books printed up, my census book printed. I'm transporting them to St. Louis. I cross the border into Colorado and I have to pay a fee on my goods. I cross the border into Kansas, I have to pay another fee on my goods. I cross the border into Missouri and I pay again. What happens to the price of my goods? It's going to skyrocket. By the time I get to St. Louis, my price is way too high. Well. The German customs union worked the same way. Get rid of the border stations, that cuts down on the fees people have to pay, that keeps the final consumer's price lower, which turns right around and promotes commerce. So I've already described that process. Here's what the map looked like in 1867. The Prussian customs union, now this is not just Prussia in gray. This is Prussia with Saxony, Anhalt, the Thuringian states, all the other ones that joined the Prussian Union. And then these darker green will grow, will join them in 1854. And then these pink ones will join them in 1866. What's left? Just this little part of Northwest Germany saying no to Prussia. Well, they too would have to give in after 1866. Just five years later, we have then a real Germany. Number four, what content did each one include? Increased gradually. You remember the first US census, 1790, had only three items in it. But by 1920, we had 33 columns. And when I got the long form in 2000, 53 questions. 
So just like in the United States, every census enumeration asks more details. Now the household Vorstandsliste, name of the household, members of household members by gender, status, occupation, religion. These are the best, that's the, the term you'll be using to write to Germany with, by the way. Names of all persons, gender, age, sometimes in categories like males one to five, males six to 10, religion, status, occupation. Now, your mouth should be watering by now, your eyes should be getting bigger, because now the question is, will this information do you any good personally? The answer is yes. I can say that I have seen at least 20,000 original census records, not stat sheets, not just numbers by city, county, province. No, the actual papers have laying on the table in front of me and my wife, and we copied 3,000 of them. I believe there are hundreds of thousands in Germany, now when I say France, I mean Alsace-Lorraine, that was lost in 1918, Poland, which had German territories lost in 1918 and again in 1945. And by the way, the European laws, international laws say that any records written in a given locality are to be returned to that locality under whatever government rules there today. The Polish archives are getting better organized all the time and they have millions of documents of German language done in locations now belonging to Poland. And by the way, never refer in your research to places now in Poland that were Germany before 1918 or 1945. Number six, where are they stored? Most in city and town archives. I am estimating 85% from all the work I've done. Oh, by the way, I asked, actually asked for census records working for clients during my pre-BYU days. Some in regional archives, 10%, very few. So the bottom line here is the farther down you can get on the ladder or the closer you can get to the hometown, the more likely you'll have the chances to find actual census record city or town archives. I always write there first. Now you're saying, wait a second, if all we know is Hessen, Grand Duchy, can I write to Darmstadt or Wiesbaden or Marburg? You can, but your chances of getting something are just about zero. They will tell you, write to the appropriate county archive, and you might say, but I don't know the county. All I know is Grand Duchy of Baden. All I know is Mecklenburg. So I might be, I don't want to burst your bubble at this time, but I want you to think about how to approach this. These are my estimates, and I believe that I'm the only one who can estimate this right now in Germany or the U.S., because nobody in Germany has done this. By the way, my book has appeared in Germany one year after it appeared here and is being sold nationwide. There is the only source of information on German census records. Have they been copied, microfilm, digitized? Some are available on microfilm. Like I said, we actually found 100 films. But if you look in the Family Street Library catalog under census, you might get 15 or 20 microfilms because they're not catalog appropriately. And again, I'm not criticizing the catalogers in Salt Lake. They're massively overwhelmed. Some are available as digital images in the internet, but there's no system for this. There's no state doing it. There's no, well, they do it by counties and sometimes by cities, but there's no program set up to make this happen in general. I know of only one census that's indexed. That's the Hanover 1852 census, and not even that completely. So this is something, it'd be nice, uh, some of you know Dirk Weisleder, the head of the German Federation of Family History Societies, he would love to start a program all across Germany to index any census records that could be found. You've got to find them first. And here's the golden question or golden goose. Can we gain access? 
the most promising approach is to contact the county, you know, the town or county. If you can find them, by the way, I think you're guaranteed access. I cannot imagine a situation where an archivist would say, well, sure, we have them, but you can't look at them. Should that happen, please write to me. Let me be involved. Uh, there's something, there's some kind of misunderstanding. Nobody ever turned me down. Nobody ever said, well, here they are, but you're not allowed to copy them. I had carte blanche everywhere I went, as I believe you will as well. Now, start with Myers Orts. You know, this is a one of your greatest resources. So if your people come from Deburg, you'll find out that's in the county of Deburg in Hessen. And you can write to the Deburg County Archive to ask about this. Now, by the way, I'm making this easy in my census book because I give you letters to write. And yes, if they search for you, if they make copies, this is something they can't do for free. And if you ask for an index, the answer should always be, no, we have no index to this census, except for three or four counties in Hanover. Well, what do their census records? When Dirk Weiss later presented this new study, this new book to his friends in Germany, they said, hey, we've got church records. What do you want? And after 1876, we have civil records. Well, that would mean, now those two resources we don't have as readily in the United States. So uh, we go to census records first because they're so easy to access. Well, census records may point to the home parish. So you might find a county census record that tells you the hometown. And that's really great because then we go to church records. Now, in my 40 plus years in the field of German genealogy, I will go out on a limb and tell you, if you were to ask me what percentage of German church records ever existing, ever made, ever written, still exist, I will go 80 to 85%. And you might be reeling at that number, uh, but I'm thinking that only, only the people who don't have this experience and haven't worked for from well over a thousand clients on different projects would disagree with me. Now, census records are much less preserved, but some census records actually list people not there. It will say son Johann Wilhelm, who's now in France working, or son Gerhard Heinrich, who went to, to North America. Our census records never ask that. And when all said and done, is anybody listening to me right now totally satisfied with the documents you have? Or couldn't you go for just one more? Okay, let's look at some census records. Now, my wife supports me in everything I do in this field, but she's not a big reader of records in digital form and microfilm. She's been in so she's been in, in more German archives than probably anybody listening to me at this moment. So this might happen in my house. Look, Jeannie, there was a daughter named Amalia who didn't come to Baltimore with the family in 1853. She might have died or just stayed in Germany. We didn't know a thing about her. Jeannie, are you listening? <laughs> this might have happened to you. So we have a daughter here who stayed in, in Germany. If you're interested in that and in, in finding her descendants and people who re related to you today, that's where you go. Okay, here's some typical census documents. First of all, you get instructions. There are always instructions, and I'm sure that we have those for our census enumerations as well. I have never actually studied those. It'd be fun to see them. 1832 handwritten instructions that went out to every town in the Grand Duchy of Baden. That's several, several thousand towns, and they're written. They went from the provincial office in Karlsruhe, in the capital, to each county and a scribe in each county copied that by hand and sent it to each town in this county. 1843, same thing. This is the communication coming from the county of Gießen in the Grand Duchy of Hessen, sometimes called hessen darmstadt And once again, had to be written. So Jeannie and I had to, to sort our way through these 
And when we found these, we thought, Yahoo, 1843. And by the way, it refers to 1841 instructions. So I know there's something going on in Hessen 1841 as well. So this is much nicer because now the county clerk doesn't have to count, doesn't have to copy these out. They printed hundreds and hundreds of these. And by the way, they can go 12 pages long in the instructions given to the county and town officials. So what about the actual documents? Yes, census enumerations were done before 1816, but the mass of German, genu uh, pardon me, geopolitics before that time would make this study almost undoable. That's why I had to start with 1816. Remember, at the end of the Thirty Years' War, 1648, there were more than 100 German states. And go back to Martin Luther, you can have as many as 300 German states. It's undoable from my perspective. But this is an example of the 1720 Schleswig-Holstein, right there between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. And it says, these columns, how many men, how many women, how many children, how many male servants, how many female servants. And these are simply the heads of households, but those are the counts of people. Westfalen was by this time a Prussian province, 1828, head of household, only by last name. That's because in Westfalen, you rarely have two people of the same surname in the same town. And that's a big presentation I'll be glad to, to make on a later date. 1829, Pomerne. If you were right here sitting in front of me, I, I'd say, put your hand up if you can tell me the first year in the United States when everybody was listed. And you can say it out loud now. You're right, 1850. This is 21 years earlier. 1840. Once again, the Urliste is the magic word. Urliste is the list of every individual by name. So here we have the Hauke family living at Baustrasse, number 291, floor number one. Father, mother, son, 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 daughter, daughter, and a domestic servant girl. By the way, there's another page for this that gives more detail. This is marvelous, 1840. 1864, most of the states in Germany were using a form like this. It is a house census. This was distributed by sort of block warden or whatever you want to call him. He might have had up to 200 houses. He went around and the instructions say, start five days before the census enumeration date, hand them out, and then collect them back and check them for accuracy and completeness and legibility. But because it's called a house list up here, it's very, very often been miscatalogued by archive people and librarians. This is a census. 1875, every single person had this. We're talking about 40 million pieces of paper, including babies, good heavens. What county, what town, what enumeration district, et cetera, et cetera. First and last names, what's your position in the household, what's your gender, year of birth, what's your status? Religion, oh wow, this is marvelous stuff. But you can see why these couldn't always be maintained. I've never seen an original filled out of the 1875 census because I think it was considered, once they got the numbers, they figured, why keep these? Who has the, the room for this? Now, I'm gonna hand out some awards here very quickly because I thought it'd be important. Uh, you might find the name of your province in here. The most frequent campaigns, mecklenburg schwerin 41 consecutive years. They did this every year from 1828 to 68. Amazing. The most valuable single census year goes to mecklenburg schwerin again. The 1819 census. Now, if you work in, in Hessen, in Hessen-Nassau, in Bayern, in Sachsen, this might draw tears to your eyes because you don't get to have this. Full name, full birth date. Place of birth. Now, the next one, your jaw will be dropping, maybe scraping on the floor. Parish of place of birth. Now you know where they were baptized. What a 
marvelous thing because that could be where the parents were married. Most names of all individuals, the award goes to Prussia. And we have nine of 13 provinces at the time they did this. Every name list beginning in 1840. Best preservation. Now, once again, your eyes are getting bigger because you're hoping, will the name of my province show up here, please? Principality of schomburg lippe I don't think there's a hand up in my audience. Nearly 100 people listening right now. Well, 107, I guess. Principality of schomburg lippe It's sandwiched between Westfalen and Waldeck and Hessen-Nassau and Hanover. It's no bigger than Utah County. In fact, it's much smaller. All pages, these are heads of household, for the years 36 to 67, 11 numerations. All pages are available for study on microfilm in the Lower Saxony State Archive in Bickerburg. By the way, this is another archive where the, where the director said, I just don't think we have those. But we found an unused, and that's unfortunate, folder with a bunch of pages and he said, good heavens, this says we have them on microfilm. We went to a microfilm cabinet he didn't know about, and there they were. And so my wife and I got to copy all kinds of those. Census collections in state archives. The Lower Saxony State Archive wins the battle here because they must have gone out years ago and invited county archivists to send documents for which they didn't have enough storage space to one of the seven regional archives. This is the biggest archive system in all of Germany. It's one of the larger states by, by area. But these are the ones, and by the way, this is great news for you because you're thinking Hanover is one of the places we have the fewest microfilms of church records. This could be really important. So in those state archives, we have Kingdom of Hanover, province of Hanover later, and that's your Oldenburg, Principality of Schaumburg, Lippe, County of Schaumburg, and Hessen Nassau. Covers a huge area. Best digitized. That'd be nice if we could get our hands on those. The tie goes to the towns of Dinkelbühl and Middlesheim. Oh, three of them. And recently, Minden and Westphal. Now, with the wave of digitization, I think you and I are right in assuming more of this will happen. If we can get the census records out where the archives can see them, if they understand that these are second or third place behind church and civil, then we could get these things digitized. And Dirk Weisslater, good buddy of mine, really wants all the local people who go into their counties and say, take these census records and digitize them. This repository for German census records of all kinds, anywhere in the world, you might be nodding because you know the answer is the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, because they have them for, oh, a dozen different states. Like I said, about 100 microfilms with bona fide census records on them, most of which are not categorized, not described in the, cat in the catalog properly. Okay, did I achieve the goals? Yes, the big goal, of course, university professors like to write books, but more importantly, I wanted to serve the genealogical community and answer the questions that the finest experts, uh, good heavens, I gave the same answers when I worked as a volunteer in the Family Street Library. I said, well, we don't know much about it. Those questions are now answered for each of 38 states in the German Empire. And I did, uh, while I was there, well, living in Vienna, of course, I went there, spent about a week studying that and wrote an article about the Austrian census records. They were like us. They did everything the same way across all the Austrian states. And they have preserved almost all theirs. What a great place to work. Sorry that most of you all have ancestry in Austria. And then while I was in uh, Mecklenburg, an archivist said, you know, I do a journal every year, a historical journal. You say that you found census records here? I didn't know about that. Could you write me an article for Mecklenburg? And I did, and it was fun. Book contents. History of Records Across Germany, Pan-German Census in 1867, and of course, what about census records for the entire empire for those years? And then for each of the 38 states, what's the location? I'll give you a map. Census enumerations, regulations, content, 
accessibility. And here, once again, your eyes are getting big. You're going to tell me where they are. And you're going to show me some typical census records from that state. That's great. We took two or three or four from each state where we had them. More content. How to write letters and emails. These are in German. But we show you that the English, they know what you're doing. You simply fill in the blanks. You can say, I know from Professor Miner's book that you did a census in 1864. Could you look, please, for the family of Heinrich Steinmann and copy any pages you find with their name? And of course, you're saying, oh, no, wait a second. I don't want to write Germany. I want to go there. And yes, we're all very sad about the fact that right now, American citizens are not allowed to travel to Germany unless they're married to Germans. Okay, for each of the provinces, I give you the spreadsheet. Notice the years on top. Well, from the year on top, it looks like 1818 only total person, but 1820 relationship to head of household, name of every person, age and years. This is in Hessen, great stuff. And then look in 1830s and 40s, we get so much more detail. This is great, I love these. This is why Ike Peace told my publisher, Eckhart, you're publishing his book, like it or not. Okay, conclusion. This is on the back cover of my book. Professor Miner went to Europe for six months in 2015 to learn why American genealogists know very little about German census records. Well, there he learned that German genealogists know very little about German census records. This is not a joke. This is true. And you still might get an answer from an archivist in Germany. Well, we didn't do any. That's why you need to quote my book and say, according to Professor Miner's book, which is in German, by the way, you did a census in these years. I would like you to look for my people in that year. Well, the question is, do you have the originals, the Urlisten for those years? Now, this is funny. Just one week ago, last week, Monday, this came from an archives whom I asked six months ago, can you give me census records? And she said, no, statistics are all we have. So she says, I've been using these somewhat quieter days between the holidays to study some boxes of documents from the town of Essen, filed under Varia et Composita. The title is well-deserved. And what did I find? Census lists and taxation lists. For 1854, 1871, she said, I'll copy for you, and I immediately had that done, and she's going to bill me $25 for those 18 pages. I can't wait to see them. Okay, the book is done. You can get it from me, rogerpminer.com, for a disc. I think I discount that $3, or you can go directly to Family Roots Publishing. They've got that. Now, one last announcement. Oh, wait a second. In two weeks, I'm giving you another brand new topic. This is a brand new topic census records, but I'm giving you another brand new topic in two weeks, residential registration that has amazing detail on your families, may even be better than census records and frequency. So now, some of you have bought the collected works on a flash drive or as a digital download in the past. The 2021 edition has nine more articles, details on five new books in the German Immigrant Series. And on top of that, we're stuffing this collection with indexes of German immigrants' volumes. Not the full books, I can't give those away because they're under copyright and the publisher would kill me. But two thirds of the 33 volumes, you can have the index. So retail price 49, uh, but if you've had it before, mark the spot that says I'm a previous purchaser, I want this for half price at the website as well. So great, great articles, 121 publications now on there and references to 72 more you can get elsewhere. I can't give those away because they're still on the market under copyright. So, and if you like our project, German Immigrants and American Church Records, we're doing four books on Kentucky this year. If, if you'd like to have this, you can make a donation to that program simply by buying one of these and every bit of that money and all my book proceeds go to the German Immigrants Program. So with that, there's the website, just scroll down, you'll see how to order that flash drive or digital download. And this is how you can donate to the project. If you've got money you don't wanna to give to whichever school or whichever cause that might not be in existence anymore and you need some good tax deductions, you can go to that site. So, Brian, I'm back to you.
Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. Miner. Um, let's see in the chat box. Yeah, if any of the audience members have any questions for Dr. Miner, please post them in the chat box and he can answer them for us. It looks like uh, Mark posted a question. He says, I'm heading to Kulmak, Bavaria in September. Are there censuses there pre-1871? What's the name again of that location? Uh, Kulmak, Bavaria. Spelled? Uh, K-U-L-M-A-C-H. Uh, Kulmak? -A okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go to Myers Gazetteer. In the, in the website and find out what the county name is. And write, well, you can write the same letter to both. Write to the city archive, Stadt Archiv, that's in my book, and ask them if they have census enumeration. And from my book, you can tell them exactly what years Bavaria did a census. Write the very same letter to the county archive. You said K-U-L-M-A-C-H? Uh, yep. Yeah. I've got Myers right in hand, and I'm going to take a second and find out what the county is. But write the same thing to the city. The city has an archive, and the county has an archive. Write to them the very same letter and quote those years. That's really important if you can get your hands on the census book. Oh, Mark. Uh, that way they can't say no to you that there wasn't a census done. They can't run away from the question. Okay, uh, I'm, I'll look this up while you ask your, the next question. Yeah, and Mark actually corrected his spelling. It's K-U-L-M-B-U-C-H. Kulm, K-U-L, Kulm? Yeah. With an M as, as in Mary? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Uh, the next okay. question. Yes? Oh, it says, it's from Steve. It says, what about censuses after 1916? I understand that the Nazis conducted a census in the 1930s where people had to prove their pure German ancestry for several generations. I also understand that the American army confiscated these records during World War II. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have Kulmbach under that spelling here, so I must be misunderstanding that. Uh, send me an email on Kulmbach, let me look it up. After 1916, the census picture in Germany is chaotic. You remember that we had the Weimar Republic up to 1933, then the National Socialist years to 1945, then the occupation to 49 when you have the establishment of two Germanys. So I don't think anybody can tell you when the next census is going to happen in Germany. There might have been four total in the, 19th, in the 20th century after the empire collapsed. Now, the 1938 census is famous. It was a census of foreigners, but that meant anybody without German citizenship. Most people, most experts believe that was meant to target the Jews who had lost their citizenship rights due to the 1934 or 1935 Nuremberg laws. So in many ways, it was a census to find out which Jews were still there of the 600,000 initially, uh, there were about 60,000 left. And by the way, that census found 80 Negroes we call them uh, black Africans, but they were called Negroes at the time. In 80 million people, there were 80 black persons from Africa. The census is for the most part microfilmed and available in the Family Steel Library. The American forces did nothing at all with that. They may have had people studying it. Uh, historians, of course, went to that in regard to Jewish families, but no, the American government has not taken any anything out of Germany except Nazi party records, which they microfilmed and returned. Next question. Awesome. And the next question is from Korean. It says, you said there is more information in family search or church records. So if I go to Salt Lake City, what do I ask for to get German census information? You don't need to go to Salt Lake City to do that. Simply pull up the Family History Library catalog. Remember on the, on the home page, Upper left, there's a term search. Click on that and it'll say catalog. Click on catalog and then put the place in as, as exact as you can get it. Province isn't good enough, at least county. And then if you get to go, one of the categories, we always hope for the category of church records, but it might say census records. But if it also says housing lists, residential registration, anything like that, pull it up. 
some of those microfilms have been digitized. Now, we're nowhere close to getting all the microfilms digitized. The experts at Family Search retracted that promise 10 years ago when they realized it was going to take far too long. So, but some of these you can look at at home. And remember, I've got 10, I think if we can get you the handouts, if Brian can help us get you the handouts, which is a word file, you'll have all those different words to put in in German or in English to find what may actually be a census record that's called a military registration, voter listing, homeowners, whatever they're called. So yes, you can do much of that at home. Otherwise, if you can get into the family history library, I'm not sure if it's even open now for anybody but professionals, you want to say, I'm looking for census records, can you guide me please? And they should send you first to my book on the shelf. That's the first thing they should do. Next question. Awesome. Um, Frank asks, many Catholic bishops in, German mandate, in Germany mandated that a census be taken by the parish priests. It was called status animarum. Animarum. Yes. Yeah. Animarum meaning living persons. Yes, the magic dates are 1749 and 1751. And mostly in, north, in northern Germany, northwest Germany, which isn't predominantly Catholic, but there are huge territories, Westphalia, uh, some larger areas in Hanover and some little bit farther south. And yes, that was that was a church census, the status animarum, a listing of living persons. And many of those are microfilmed. I think probably every one of those is microfilmed that the family history collection development people have been able to find. Those are good. Those are really good because they're family groups. Awesome. Yeah. And he asks, do you know if an overall index or listing has been made of such of these Catholic censuses? Boy, I don't know about that. You'd have to, to Google that and see if you can come up with something or ask the people in the Family History Library if anybody has done a master index. I, I doubt that because I haven't heard of it. But then so many things are happening. I can't possibly hear about them all. And I'm not in the library. So I have a contact with clients and students. And I'm doing my big project still 30 hours a week. But I can't ask, answer that. So I go to the internet and start Googling terms. Catholic census, use the, use the year 1749, you'll get the best returns. And you could actually contact Catholic church offices in the diocese over there in Germany. Go to the big cities in Catholic areas. Look at Trier, look at Koblenz, Köln, Cologne, Münster, places like that, and go to the Catholic archive, ask them. I'd, and if you find a list, by the way, please uh, send me a link so I can learn about that too. Great. And Linda asks, do the census exist for Newarp, N-E-U-W-A-R-P, um, Christ? Um, you can pull up the chat too, um, Roger, I can? if you want. How do I do yeah. that? Um, it should be at the bottom. I still have my microphone. Let's see. Do I have to share a screen with you? I have to get rid of my. Um, I can share. I can share my screen, and that might help. Um, it might be under more, and then chat. Oh, there's the chat. Okay. Yeah. So I was just struggling to uh, read some of these German words, but. Right. So how do it's I from see? Linda. How do I see the one from Linda? I don't see that with. Do uh, I scroll, scroll up, up a little bit. Yeah. Scroll, there's Linda Wallace. Uh huh. Okay, uh, the Polish archives are getting better all the time. And uh, get your internet maps out to convert the Neuwarp to the Polish name and the county, Uckermunde, uh, translate that to the Polish name and get into their website. They have a website. You can send them a Polish language message do a good translation from the internet, but have a qualified person read it first because you've seen some pretty goofy translations from the computers. So write to them and tell them as much as you know. You've got the town, Neuwarp, and you've got the town name in, in Polish there. You need the Ukamunda name in Polish as well. And write to that archive. They have regional archives. They have district archives, a great archive system. They're very slow in responding, extremely slow. So, but they will respond and they will charge you. I think they charge about $30 before they do anything. Pay it, it's worth it. What's next? Great. 
And then Diana asks after that, I'm confused, is the book in German or English? The book is in English that you buy here, but the book is, I translated the book and it was published in Germany. So it's the first book on the topic in either language. So if you have a German friend, write me an email and I'll tell you where the publisher is so you can get that in German. So Perfect. the book here, the book here of a course is in English. Awesome. And then Carol asks, I have an ancestor with the surname Lynch that immigrated to the U.S. He reported that he was born in Annalt uh, Cawthon. Anhalt Cawthon, right. That was a that was a district in Anhalt. Awesome. Yeah. Right. You would write to Magdeburg, M-A-G-D-E-B-U-R-G. That's the capital of the province of what's called now Sachsen Anhalt. They put a bunch of states together after East Germany was annexed with, by West Germany. Write to Magdeburg and put the question to them. Because Anhalt Curtin is a district in the Duchy of Anhalt. It's not a it's not the town they came from. So write to Magdeburg and they will direct your letter to a more exact place if they can determine that. And that is nowhere, that's hundreds of miles from Bavaria. There's some, there's some confusion there and I'm guessing those are in the United States records where some people in, in the United States didn't have any idea about German geopolitics, et cetera. So best way to, to pay money if we go to Pat's question is if it's very little, write me an email. I've got a German account. I can take your check for 30 bucks and send 24 euros to somebody over there. Otherwise, there are lots of sites on the internet. You might have to pay some steep fees, but there are banks and there are websites. Just Google something like pay German, let's see, pay euros to Germany from America, and you'll find a bunch of websites that will take a fee into that for you. I'll do it for free. I've got a lot of money in Germany that I need to get out of there, and your check transfers it to me in the U.S. while I transfer your stuff. I literally will take bank numbers from you and send money to their bank account, and you won't pay a fee either way. So, Barbara Warner, born in Baden, 1860, came to American, okay. Change the name of Werner from Werner. That can happen, right? Spelling variations. If you look at my spelling variations book, those names can be interchangeable. So, boy, uh, the question is, can you find him as Warner or anything other than Warner in the U.S.? Church books are fabulous about this. American records from, from county, state, and federal are not good. But if you can find him in a church in the United States, like my German Immigrants Project does, then you might get a more reliable spelling, not to mention his actual hometown. So I'd start by finding him in a church in the US. But in Baden, that's going to be tough. And you'll have to search Werner and Varner the same way. So how are we doing on time, Brian? Oh, we're great. I think there's only one more question. So do we want to just address that uh, last one, and then we'll finish. The up. ship arrival records. Yeah. About uh, over my forty years of using these, I'd say that about one in five passenger lists will have a hometown on it. The rest say things like Germany, maybe Prussia. They might give you a province, but the same information you can get from American census records. You're better off by far, many times over, finding them in a church in the United States. Hopefully they're Lutheran because the Catholic records don't do much more than Germany. But I really think your chances are about 20%. If you find them on a, on a ship list, that it will say a town in Germany. And the spellings of those are wild because they're written by quite often stewards, I should say bursers on the ship who might be American who are struggling or German bursers who don't know your dialect when you get on that boat and sail across the ocean. So I'll zoom down to one more here. Let's see. Um, I think they just email. asked for your email address. Okay. Roger, P as in Paul, Minert at Gmail. And no, that's all small, no funny stuff. R-O-G-E-R-P-M-I-N-E-R-T at gmail.com. And as I showed you the 
the website www.rogerpminard.com and about the books or if you'd like to help us keep my team of students working on our German immigrant books in Kentucky and Kansas coming up then germanresearch.org will do that so yes Brian why, Brian, why don't you put that on there germanresearch.org that'll get you to the website about how you can help us with your kind donation so at the very least take advantage of that offer for 121 articles and reference to 72 books for your $49 donation for the download which you can have within 24 hours and the flash drive that we can mail you very quickly so Otherwise, this has been a great privilege for me to show, to share with you what became a marvelous adventure for my wife and me for six months. We came home with the book 98% finished. That's how successful we were, blessed in every possible way. Never missed an appointment in an archive. Never were turned down for anything we asked for. Never had a traffic jam that stopped us from getting to where we wanted to go. Blessed in every possible way. If you, if you believe in God, he was on our side. But thank you for so very much for coming and joining us for this experience. Hope to have you see me or hear from me in two weeks again. Thank you, Brian, for your support. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Dr. Miner. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Just a reminder about our webinar next week on the 20th at the same time, 5.30 p.m., beginning research in Ireland, Ireland with James Tanner. And um, a lot of people were asking about the handout. Dr. Miner, if you will just email that handout to me, I can get it um, posted to the Family History Library website, which is shown right here, fh.lib.byu.edu. Um, I, I will do that by tomorrow. Perfect. perfect. Awesome. I want everybody and to have that, everybody who wants it. It's a Word document, probably four pages, but very important. Great. Yeah, and I will post that with the recording in a couple days when we get it edited and uploaded. So thanks so much once again for joining us and have a great day, everyone.